This is what it was like to be a child in Jackson, Mississippi in the 1990s. You learned about civil rights in school, that it happened in the 1960s, and it had a beginning and an end. But you also knew that most of the students in your public school were African American, that most white kids went to private school, that many white families had left Jackson, that the nice stores and the movie theaters had left Jackson. You rode bikes with your father downtown because the streets were flat and deserted. When Mississippi made the national news, it always seemed like the butt of a decades old joke. And at the end of every year, you'd see the lists. There we were, at the bottom of education, life expectancy, healthcare, at the top of poverty, teen pregnancy, infant mortality. There wasn't a category for racism or homophobia or general hate, but based on the way people talked about us, you figured we came in first there too. If Mississippi is my story, this is the plot line it has given to me. At age five, I thought this place was just a home. I had a family, a cat, friends of all colors, and access to my dad's typewriter. At age 10, I still liked wrestling with my brother, but I noticed that some kids lived in different parts of town and didn't have as many books. When we traveled and told people we were from Mississippi, they were always surprised, like they had never seen one of us in the wild before. <laughs> At age 15, I could identify racism and decided that I was justified in hating the place I was from. Let me be kind to myself and acknowledge that at that age, I was embarrassed by everything, my parents, my community, my own awkward self. So I chose to go to college in the least Mississippi-like place I could imagine, Massachusetts. <laughs> it seemed like courage at the time. Did I get a good education up there? Yes. Was I surrounded by people who also trumpeted love and diversity? Yes. Did people continue to make jokes about Mississippi? Well, yes. Then why, after four years, did I run back to the South like a child to its mother, vowing to love it, to never leave it again? This is a story about how to come home again. You know what they say, you can't do it. Home is always different when you go back. It's the shell we discard. But there I was at age 20, homesick. I missed people asking me all the time how I was and how my folks were doing, asking me for my experience and giving me theirs in turn. After four years, and then Hurricane Katrina, my senior year, I had become defensive of Mississippi. I was in Jackson for Katrina. I remember tying down the porch furniture and watching the news until the falling trees outside brought down the power lines. I had seen the first images coming out of New Orleans, Waveland, past Christiane. That night, as the rain raged on, I dreamed that the floodwaters took away everyone I loved. But in the morning, it was calm, and we went outside and started picking up branches and we saw that everyone else had come outside to pick up branches. And we shared stories and laughed, and then shared food and ice. And when we were done with our neighborhood, we looked around for anything else that needed picking up. My mother and I went to the fairgrounds to wash oil and mud off of the rescued animals that were being brought up from the coast. I'm actually very afraid of dogs, but I stood by a tub of water and someone put a terrier in my hands. His fur was matted and his legs were trembling. When I turned the hose on him, he began to whine. The water came off him in dark currents. I rubbed dish detergent in his skin and thought of pelicans and oil spills and how it turns out that all of us, the dogs and the humans, were equally scared. But we were both there in that moment. 
washing and getting washed, allowing empathy to make us better than we thought we were. After college, I went to graduate school in North Carolina to study history. Like most Southerners, I liked telling stories, except I wanted to find those stories that were outside the circles of power, that were nearly impossible to tell. I don't think I would have looked for these voices of women, of enslaved people, of American Indians, if I hadn't already learned to embrace my home, the ever-conflicted, cross-cultural, oft-marginalized, and oft-marginalizing South. If we embraced this home then, both the power of its diversity and the shame of its violence, what kind of lesson can it teach us? At age 25, I walked over the line from history into fiction. I wanted to know more, to know everything, not just to read the words left behind, but to burrow into the hearts and desires of people who are completely unlike me. I started writing novels, which, even more than history, are seen as an escape, a way to shed your skin for a few hours and to learn about a Russian countess or a wandering hobbit. So how do you write about characters who are different from yourself? Based on my limited experience, here is a quick three-step guide. Number one, at least one person in your story should be different from yourself. For instance, I have written about men. I have also written about enslaved women, Creek Indian boys, parents, brothers, Anglicans, orphans, Frenchmen, grandfathers, sailors, and murderers. I happen to be none of these things. <laughs> Number two, give them a backstory, which means give them history. Figure out where they come from, who their parents are, what it was like to be a child, to be a teenager, what songs they sing, what food they eat, how they fall in love, what they're afraid of, and what they wish they could forget. The more you know about someone's past, the more you understand. And then, number three, write yourself into every character in your story. Acknowledge that you are not a murderer, but then let that murderer have your fear of heights. Figure out what connects the other and the self. Fiction's most obvious job is to give us the map to a different world. But its most important job is to bring us home again, to settle us back in the real world with a heart that's ever so slightly changed, to make it possible to see our neighbors in a new light. The fiction that I want to write, that Mississippi taught me to write, is the kind that takes giant empathetic leaps across time, across cultures, dives into the past, tries to untangle all the broken threads there, looks for the untold stories, finds the voiceless, searches for the common spark that makes an enslaved woman on the run as human as the white man who claimed to own her. This state has a complicated and brutal history, but if we don't tell the ugly stories, how can we understand the proud ones? If we don't come home, how can we hope to change it, to change ourselves? Now, at age 30, Knowing that plot lines start with conflict but move towards resolution, I'm looking to Mississippi not as a state doomed by slavery, by Jim Crow, by lynchings and cross burnings and terrorism, but as a state awaiting its third act. So how do we write that? Here's my advice to Mississippi. To the people who live here and the people who are from here and even the people who may never visit, if escape and empathy, lifting off and coming home, are fundamental elements in good fiction, then they also must be integral to a good life. When you're getting cabin fever in your body, walk over into your neighbor's mind and look for a piece of yourself there. When you find yourself making simple judgments, put your hands on that terrier or whatever it is you're afraid of and feel that it's shaking too. When you're fed up, with Mississippi in the present, explore its past. Discover not just the inexplicable hate, but also the courage of those who fought back against hate, the joy that existed beyond stereotype, the real love that bound communities of different races, classes, religions. And when you're full to the brim of Mississippi in the past, 
look to the future. How will you make it a place people can come home to? Let's say you're a little older now. You're living in New Orleans, close enough to Jackson to come back once a month to see your two little nephews. You make up stuff for a living. You build empathetic bridges that you hope your readers will walk across. You are incredibly grateful to live in a region that has never become complacent, that fights every day for more just communities. We fight because we understand the value of this particular place, of these specific people, and we believe that a Mississippi founded on empathy is a vision worth defending. You see new restaurants in downtown Jackson. The art scene is thriving. This summer was the first Mississippi Book Festival, which was so crowded you couldn't get into the session you wanted to see. Now, when you look at the list at the end of the year, you're reminded that Mississippi, last in so many things, ranks at the top of charitable giving. Giving of time, of money, of understanding. If we let ourselves, we can empathize like nobody's business. That's what we can do. No matter how far we travel, that's the home we have to come back to. That's the home we have to build. Thank you.